it was a complete disaster. You know, it basically stopped making money. Um, it was, yeah, it was pretty devastating. And today it does between 5 and 7k a month in revenue. Hello and welcome back to Indie Bites, the podcast where I bring you stories of fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less. Today I am talking to Monica Len, who is the founder running three profitable indie businesses after leaving her full-time job two years ago. She runs Affiliate, a SaaS product which allows you to manage and track affiliate commissions, the Blogging for Devs newsletter and paid community for developers looking to grow an audience, and finally, Not a Nomad, a travel blog that accounted for almost 50% of Monica's revenue last year as she grew her portfolio of projects from 30k to over 100 k a year now if you're a regular listener you'll have noticed many of my recent guests have leveraged the power of seo to fuel the growth of their business and monica is no different in fact she mentions on the show how the thing that ties all her projects together is indeed content and seo they're all related in some way to content and seo and guess what she uses to help find keywords to rank for it's hrefs So Indie Hackers, if you want to get more traffic to your side project, give Ahrefs a go. They've got a fantastic set of free tools too, which you can find at ahrefs.com slash A-W-T. That's A-H-R-E-F-S dot com or hit the link in the show notes. Let's get into the conversation. Monica, how are you doing? Welcome to the pod. Doing pretty good, James. Thanks for having me on. You've got a lot on. Three different projects, all generating revenue. How are you splitting your time nowadays between them? Mostly I'm spending my time on my SaaS. There are a lot of moving parts when you're running a software business. You have the product development, support, sales, partnerships, all of this kind of stuff. Whereas the other two, I can run semi-passively. So the community, I do have to check it every day. I do have to like host events and, and do things like that. But mostly it's not time sensitive. It just takes a little bit every day. And then finally, the blog is pretty passive, so that's nice that it makes up most of the the income. Do you feel like it's a detriment to you at any point having multiple projects that split your attention? I mean, if I were to focus on one of these things 100%, then of course it would be more successful than it is today. It's kind of like a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, if you have these multiple income streams, something happens, let's say a pandemic, you you know, you have other things to fall back on. So you have that security. But on the other hand, of course, as you said, your time and attention and energy is always divided. But for me, at least these three projects all fit into the same bucket. They're all related in some way to content and SEO. And so I can learn things on the different projects that end up applying to each other. There are synergies. So if they were totally unrelated, it would probably be a lot worse. But yeah, I'm able to find ways to leverage what I learned from one on the other projects and and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you're doing is delegating. Now, delegating is something that a lot of indie founders are scared of doing. They like having they like having control. And often there's certain parts of the business that they think that only they can do. But actually delegating it makes life a lot easier. Have you been delegating for a while? Yeah, so... I started like hiring the first contractors for my SaaS business in spring of last year. So I started hiring content writers because Mm. I realized it was just not possible for me to write content while also developing the product and doing everything else. Writing good content takes a long time, but make no mistake, I still love being in control. There's no way that if I hadn't started to bring on other people that I would be where I am now with the SaaS business. I also hired at the end of last year a virtual assistant who acts as a marketing coordinator, deals with Mm. like partnership kind of related stuff. Now I have support engineers and it's always about taking that kind of next step for me of like, how can I take the things where I don't need to be the one doing it? Yeah. and find someone else to do it. And if you hire good people, then eventually they will either do it better than you or maybe your level of perfection is not necessary. <laughs> it's okay if the blog outline is 80% of what you might do. You can go add in those bits for 10 minutes later and just not spend all that time. And uh, how are you managing this at the level of revenue you're at? Yeah, so because of the fact that I don't have to rely on the SaaS business for income in any way, Mm. I reinvest the vast majority of the revenue into content, into hiring people. So that, of course, takes a big part of it out because I don't have to make a salary. I have passive income streams. And that's, I think, maybe a mistake that people make is they must think, 
oh, I need to get a full-time employee. Oh, I'm going to hire a developer. Well, these days developers make six figures. Like, does that mean yeah. I can't hire a developer until that point? But like, there are a lot of people in different situations with different skill sets that like you can hire for just a couple of tasks or some hours a week and ramp up. Like I started with 10 hours a week, but with a virtual assistant now doing 20. Mm. And of course, you know, maybe I will be able to hire this person full time at some point. But like it can be done gradually. You just have to accept that your own productivity it will kind of taper off a little bit while you're onboarding that person. And that's yeah, like a yeah. long-term trade-off in mindset. Hiring a VA is a very interesting one. It's something that I've certainly considered myself, especially with more and more client work coming on. And some of the things that are repeatable, um, I feel like I could <laughs> really benefit with having someone. But Like I, what? I, Answering I, email? This is a big one for me. Uh, email is an interesting one. I was more thinking like scheduling episodes, staying on top of my calendar. Mm. So what, what do you use your VA for? Mostly running our blog. So mm. I used to coordinate with the writers, everything. The thing about working with freelance writers is that their availability is variable. Yeah. So if you really want to keep up a consistent publishing schedule, you can't work with just one. So by now we have like a small fleet of writers that we're working with and yeah, just the communication, onboarding, doing trial tasks. By now, I have uh, delegated that to the VA. So she is able to reach out to the writer, offer the trial task, prepare the brief for the writer, even paying them, collecting the invoice and everything. Mm -hmm. So now there are writers who have done full trials with us and I have never spoken to them, which is an amazing feeling. I, I want to move on a little bit and talk about your travel blog. What a cool thing to be supported by this relatively passive income. When did you start it? How did it start to grow? Did you have ambitions to turn this into something that could support you? Not at all. So when I started, I moved to Europe and I just, I just wanted to document my travels. I started a photography hobby and stuff like that. And it wasn't until a couple of years in that I started to see, okay, the site is getting like 30,000 visitors per month. Is that a lot? Like I had no <laughs> benchmarks. And what really changed the game for me was uh, happening upon uh, some Facebook groups where other bloggers were. They were talking about affiliate marketing, how they were making money with their blogs, SEO, and all of this kind of stuff. And it was mind-blowing because I realized that all of these people were having more success, like over here, like somewhere I didn't know about. Mm. And I was doing it on solo mode. And all these people are like collaborating. And today it does between five and seven K a month in revenue between affiliate marketing and ads. But I'm fingers crossed for like a, a 10 K month this summer. Once we have hopefully recovered from the pandemic in the travel yeah. industry. What happened with the site then? It was a complete disaster. Like today it's getting over a hundred thousand monthly sessions. Back then it was probably like 15,000 maybe. Like it was a dramatic decline. You know, it basically stopped making money. Um, it was, yeah, it was pretty devastating. <laughs> so thankfully things are on the up again. So did you have blogging for devs and a film eight during the pandemic? Did you have those things or was were they born out of? Okay. Yeah, so I started a film eight before the pandemic. And then what I realized was that our word of mouth growth that we had in the travel industry among travel bloggers was not going to keep working while none of them were making money. Mm. Because people who are experiencing business stress, they don't talk about all the amazing products they're using. And we run an analytics tool. And so blogging for devs kind of came later as like a reaction to that. I had a bit existential crisis. I had no money. I was living off of savings. It was like very stressful. And yeah, blogging for devs and the paid community is how I managed to turn that around. Okay, nice. And Affiliate is born out of your need for wanting to track these affiliates from your affiliate supported site. Were there just not tools available that did what you needed needed to do? I mean, at the time, I didn't even know how to Google for these things. Mm. So I wasn't even aware of competitors, which by the way, if you don't think you have competitors, one, you <laughs> might, but two, it's also kind of a bad sign. Monica, you're pretty good at blogging. You've got your blog, you've grown it, you're doing it now for, for your SaaS, for your community. A lot of people might also want to start blogging, but they've got no idea how they do it. For those that want to know right now on this podcast where they start with blogging, what should they do? 
you have to decide for yourself, do you want the blog to make money or is it just for fun? What mm. is your why? If your goal is to make money, then you need to start writing content that's valuable to others and has a revenue generation plan. If you want to be a thought leader, then, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's kind of like a different roadmap. Mm. So the main thing that you need to do is figure out who is the target audience mm. and what are the things they're going to be searching for before they need a product like yours. So it's similar to affiliate marketing that way if you're doing affiliate driven content, but it's not just about getting the target market. It's about getting them at the right moment. And tools like Ahrefs are obviously amazing for this. You can also distribute content in other ways, but I would say that's the main thing. And most indie hackers probably don't 100% yet know who their target audience mm. is. It might change over time. That can be something that's a bit slow. So I always recommend people think that blogging and SEO is going to be their main traffic driver, the main source of new uh, trials and so on. But it's a long-term strategy. Like you need to get your first users through scrappier methods, whether that's like communities on Twitter, Facebook groups, or something like that. And I, I, I want to just round off now. I was reading through your year in review blog loved it you also had these super open reports where you were sharing revenue it is a trend that people share revenue numbers but often i'm seeing well more and more i'm seeing people get to a certain stage and they think it's not benefiting anyone really sharing numbers at this point so i wonder what your view on sharing numbers is up until a point and why you've now taken a step back after being so open with those numbers so I started writing income reports in the beginning of last year, mostly as a way to be accountable to myself. I had a really tough 2020 and mm. I wanted to show my work and just have a way to look back on my progress. And of course, people love it because reading about other people's income is obviously fascinating. But the reality is uh, a couple fold. One is that my target customers are typically not reading these kind of reports. So in the end, you can build an audience and get a bunch of Twitter followers for sharing revenue numbers, but that doesn't mean people are actually signing up for and using your product. So that alignment was really not there for me. And the second thing is that at the end of the day, you're probably in a competitive industry. And as an indie hacker, you also have a lot of disadvantages. You know, some of my main competitors are owned by big companies. They have mm. a lot of funding. And the last thing I need to do is give them a roadmap of what's working for me. And at the end of the day, I couldn't be as transparent as I would have liked to be if I really wanted to actively help someone out who was in the same spot. And so now I switch from doing these public income reports to kind of a private newsletter to a small group of founders that I respect founders that are on the same journey or they started where I am. And so they can look back and, and give me some advice. And so that's a pretty cool way that I found to like keep the accountability and have people to talk to, but without putting my entire strategy on display for well-funded competitors. Monica, you've got all of these projects. Um, you've taken on all the risks to become an indie founder. Um, you're spending a lot of time working weekends. Uh, I want to know if you're having fun. I think what's fun for someone maybe isn't fun for someone else. I love what I'm doing. I love the systematizing. I love watching my charts go up. I love fixing things. I love building the product. Sometimes I look at what we built and it's just like, wow, this is so cool. And at the end of the day, even though it is stressful, it is hard. I put in even more hours than I work at a high growth fintech startup, but I'd still rather do it like this because I'm in control. I don't have to deal with politics of working at a big company and I own hundred percent of my company. So if I'm going to get acquired one day or something like that, I get all of the upside. So yeah. Yeah. It's fun and talking to other founders is obviously the most fun part because they totally get it. At the end of every episode, I ask for three recommendations, a book, a podcast, and an indie hacker or entrepreneur that you follow or are inspired by. Number one book that I have read recently that other indie hackers should read would be Founding Sales. So the last podcast uh, that I picked up was Tropical MBA. Yeah. I think a lot of people have been listening to that for a long time, but I just started on the backlog. So I've been really enjoying that one. And then the last one is about an indie hacker. Oh, I have stuff. someone to recommend. The person I want to recommend is Josh Ho. So he is the CEO and technical founder of Referral Rock. So he also started out coding the product himself and now runs like a 
very successful SaaS business. Monica, thank you so much for the recommendations. I appreciate you joining the pod. Yeah, thanks for having me, James. It was fun to finally meet you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Indie Buys. If you want to learn more about SEO, then check out today's sponsor, Hrefs. And if you want to find out how I'm planning to take over TikTok with my friend Dan Rowden, check out the latest episode of No More Mondays, available on all the best podcast platforms. See you next week.